First M60 tanks arrived in the 3rd Armored Division of the U.S. Army in Germany. In early January 1961, this information was passed on to Marshal Vasily Chuikov, Chief of the Soviet Armed Forces, Deputy Minister of Defense, and famed commander of the Soviet Defense of Stalingrad. The Soviet Army had just concluded its future medium tank program in failure, and Premier Nikita Khrushchev had hamstrung the development of conventional tanks in favor of new but immature space-age missile technology. There was nothing available to counter this new American tank, save for one project. The young and ambitious chief designer of the Ural Vagonzavod Design Bureau had been dabbling in tank design since 1953, and his fledgling design bureau had come up with the Object 166, the first Soviet tank with a smoothbore gun. Spurred on by Marshal Chuikov, in August 1961, Object 166 entered service as the T-62. Although the adoption of the T-62 medium tank was a knee-jerk reaction to the M-60, its long and arduous path to existence originally had nothing to do with the M-60 at all. In fact, the creation of the T-62 was remarkable in that it would not have occurred but for a precise series of three serendipitous events, all involving high-ranking government officers. The intervention of Marshal Chuikov was merely the third and final one. The fate of the T-62 and the design bureau responsible for its creation were shaped by what could only be described as divine intervention. The design of the T-62 was an amalgamation of several existing concepts which had previously remained at the experimental stage, but were nevertheless already well established before the M-60 was known in the USSR. In addition to all the research that had been accumulated since the start of the future Soviet medium tank program in 1953, several more years were spent in shaping the T-62 into its final form between 1958 to 1960. This all took place without direct knowledge of foreign tank developments and without any specific reference threats. Rather, it was simply driven by a desire to develop a better tank. The best understood feature of the T-62 is perhaps its hull, which was basically a stretched rendition of a T-55 hull. Its turret, however, was not related to the T-55 at all, but instead came from the Object 140, a stillborn prototype made to compete in the future Soviet medium tank program. At the same time, many of the improvements used to create the T-55 also came from Object 140, so while most of the T-62's primary characteristics were derived from the T-55, Object 140 was the common ancestor to both tanks, and it was also the tank to which the T-62 owed its identity. So to talk about the T-62, we need to start from the beginning. After winning a bloody but triumphant victory at the end of World War II, the Soviet Union demobilized much of its war industry and drastically slowed down arms production. For the engineers and technologists in the many research and design institutions of the country, the relief from the urgency of overcoming the German threat was a welcome opportunity to be bolder, taking more risks in their innovations. The work that was carried out in the years following the war shaped the Soviet army for the remainder of its existence, giving birth to the likes of the AK-47 assault rifle, the RPG-2 grenade launcher, the T-10 heavy tank, and of course, the T-54 medium tank. However, some institutions had better opportunities than others. The Ural Vagonzavod Railway Carriage Factory in Nizhny Tagil, which had been converted into a temporary wartime home for the Kharkov Locomotive Factory, regained its status as an independent entity when the original Kharkov factory complex in Soviet Ukraine was rebuilt and its workers returned home. Ural Vagonzavod inherited the largest tank assembly line in Europe, and the UK BTM in-house tank design bureau, helmed by Alexander Marozov, who designed the T-54 and oversaw its production on the factory floor. However, the situation at the design bureau saw a turn for the worse in December 1951, when Marozov was appointed chief designer at the revitalized design bureau in Kharkov. Upon his departure, the position of chief designer was left vacant, and there was an exodus of skilled workers from UKBTM. Now practically gutted, UKBTM was only capable of small-scale design work, and its problems continued to grow due to high staff turnover. Most of the work passed over to UKBTM was a hodgepodge of unglamorous tasks, ranging from mundane troubleshooting on the T-54 design based on the feedback of army tankers, to making minor design refinements assigned by Harkov, 
to doing odd jobs for other industries, like designing pumps and winches for oil wells. However, even with the apparent lack of future prospects, a small group of talented and ambitious young designers remained in the Bureau, enthusiastically taking on jobs and taking the initiative of making improvements to the T-54. Among them was Leonid Kartsev, who had leapt through the ranks throughout his career, culminating with his appointment to chief designer at UKBTM in July 1953 at the tender age of 31. At the tail end of the very same year, the Soviet military launched a program for a successor to the T-54, with preliminary plans for the Kharkov locomotive factory to compete with the Kurov factory in Leningrad. Kartsev caught wind of the program some time before it was officially declared, and on his own initiative, he came up with a medium tank proposal that he felt would meet the preliminary requirements. This proposal was poorly received by the main armored directorate of the Soviet army, and given the near total lack of original tank design experience at UKBTM, this was completely understandable. However, thanks to the intervention of the Minister for Transport Machine Building, who was incidentally the previous director of Ural Vagonzavod, Kartsev managed to get his foot in the door. Meanwhile, the Kurov proposal was eliminated without ever leaving the discussion stage, despite the extensive experience of its illustrious chief designer, Yosef Kotin. This left just Kharkov and Nizhny Tagil in the race. Now that UKBTM was officially an experimental tank design bureau, state funds, fresh young engineers, and new facilities were approved, setting the stage for Kartsev's proposal, the Object 140, to make the leap from paper to metal. The Object 140 competed against the Object 430 from Marazov, and both tanks were rather similar, even beyond the basic resemblance that many Soviet tanks seem to share. There were a number of reasons for this. In his memoirs, Kartsev claimed that the military technical requirements were rather conservative. They amounted to what was essentially a 10% improvement over the T-54 in every category. So it's not very surprising that both design bureaus just took the existing T-54 as a starting point, instead of creating something radical from scratch. Only a modest improvement in protection was targeted, using the 100mm gun of the T-54 and its ammunition as the reference threat to represent an enemy medium tanks gun, in contrast to the German 8.8cm KWK-43 used in the creation of the T-54. Meanwhile, mobility would have been only slightly improved over the T-54, as the new tank was to maintain the same 36-ton combat weight, but run on a 580-horsepower engine. And finally, the improvement in firepower was to be achieved by using the new high-velocity 100mm D-54 gun. As long as the tank stayed within the weight limit and met the modest performance goals, the two rival designers were basically free to do as they wished. In parallel to the new medium tank program, the option of simply upgrading the existing T-54 with the new gun was also explored by Ural Vagonzavod with the Object 141. This was basically a T-54 with the D-54 gun and a single-plane stabilizer. In 1955, work on the Object 141 ceased and development switched to the Object 139 as a continuation of the same theme, although it was a more extensive effort since it had the same fire control system as the Object 140. Unfortunately, during the process of assembling Object 140 tanks and then testing them, Kartsev became aware of the various production, operability, and maintenance issues that were inadvertently baked into the fundamental design of the powertrain and the hull. The most serious issues were that the engine compartment could not provide reasonable access to the powertrain, and the hull was not suitable for mass production, as there was only one metalworking plant in the USSR that was capable of rolling variable thickness plates and pressing them into the curved shape of the hull sides. The foundations for the idea of the T-62 were laid in the second half of 1957, in the midst of these events, when Kartsev decided to launch another project, Object 142, under a private initiative. It was to be an adaptation of Object 140, except with its suspension and drivetrain unified with the T-54B, and the rear of the hull reverting to the original T-54 design. This would have solved some of the issues with the Object 140, while still retaining at least some of its essence. It was likely an attempt to salvage the Object 140 project, but it was not to be, as in March 1958, after realizing that it was a total dead end, Kartsev decided to request the termination of Ural Vagonzavod's participation in the medium tank competition. His request was granted, 
and on 6th of July 1958, work on Object 140 was officially discontinued. At the same time, Object 139 was also discontinued because it turned out that contractors were unable to supply the necessary quantity of sites and stabilizers to support mass production. To top it all off, Kartsev decided to discontinue Object 142 as well, likely because it used the Object 140 hull. This rapid series of failures might have been the end of Kartsev's adventure into serious tank design, but by sheer tenacity, or just a desire to keep the momentum going at the design bureau, he began to approach the issue from the opposite direction. Instead of adapting the Object 140 with T-54 parts, he would adapt the upcoming T-55 with Object 140 parts. This was the point at which the T-62 can be said to have begun its life in earnest. Like the Object 139 and Object 141 projects, Kartsev decided to upgun the T-55 with the D-54, and in order to overcome the insufficient size of the original hull and turret, the T-55 hull was lengthened. Some elements of the Object 140 design were also added to the hull, and a new single-piece turret similar to the Object 140 turret was worked out. The resultant tank was Object 165. Technologically, it was a low-risk option, since the Object 140 turret was unproblematic and many of the best and most practical innovations of the Object 140 project had already been integrated into the T-55. If successful, the project could even partly fulfill the conservative requirements of the future Soviet medium tank program, which was still ongoing. Work continued in this direction until late 1958, when the Object 165 project saw an unexpected turn of events. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev was presented with the T-12 Rapira smoothbore anti-tank gun by the main rocket and artillery directorate. The highlight of the gun was its high penetration power against sloped armor. Impressed, Khrushchev suggested replacing rifled guns in tanks with smoothbore guns and to produce 200 such tanks in the next year. Despite the rather whimsical nature of the request, the idea of arming tanks with a powerful smoothbore gun was taken quite seriously. Kartsev recalls in his memoirs that he was urgently summoned to Moscow at the end of November 1958 to discuss the possibility of putting such a tank into production. Given that Ural Vagonzovod had just recently dropped out from the Soviet future medium tank competition, the factory was now ostensibly free to handle such a project if it came to fruition. During the discussions, Kartsev objected to the idea of putting the T-12 in a tank because its ammunition would be unacceptably long. Instead, they settled on modifying the D-54 with a barrel bored out to 115 millimeters. Kartsev then proposed to proceed with the idea by using Object 165, which was, very conveniently, immediately available as a low-risk platform capable of mounting the new gun. This proposal was accepted, and on the 31st of December 1958, the Soviet Ministry of Defense approved Object 165 for further development, and Ural Vagonzovod received state financing for the project. In January 1958, the main artillery directorate approved the technical specifications for the new 115mm gun and its ammunition based on the preliminary calculations. And then, on the 13th of January, the State Committee for Defense Technology submitted a letter of recommendation on the further development of Object 166 to the USSR Council of Ministers. The project theme for Object 166 was described by the State Committee as developing, quote, a medium tank based on the T-55 with a new powerful smoothbore gun stabilized in two planes and cartridges for it, codename Molot, unquote. However, this was revised less than two months later with only one change. The project was described as developing a, quote, tank destroyer based on the medium tank T-55 with a new powerful smoothbore gun stabilized in two planes of guidance and cartridges for it, codenamed Molot, unquote. The intent of the project was to, quote, provide in comparison with the equipment of the T-55 tank a significant increase in the initial velocity of an armor-piercing projectile, the armor penetration, especially at large angles of inclination of the armor, and the range of a direct shot." Unquote. At the same time, it was specified that the high-velocity ammunition would simply be no worse than that of the T-55. How much was known about the prospective threats like the T-95 medium tank is unclear, and at this point enemy tanks armed with the 105mm L7 gun were not mentioned at all. 
The task of designing the 155mm smoothbore gun was assigned to factory number 9. NIMI was to create the ammunition for it, and the stabilization of the gun was to be sorted out by factory number 46. The workload was relatively light for all parties involved. For factory number 9, there was no need to design an entirely new gun, but simply create a new barrel to fire the new 115mm ammunition, and adapt the gun to stay within the same operating parameters as the D-54. For NIMI, previously responsible for designing all Soviet tank and artillery ammunition, including the smoothbore ammunition of the Rapira anti-tank gun, their work mainly involved adapting the existing 100mm smoothbore ammunition to a new caliber. They extensively reused their earlier work on the cartridge cases, propellant, and projectile designs to the extent that the 115mm HE frag round was created by simply modifying the heat round, and the 115mm APF SDS rounds were simply scaled up from the original 100mm rounds. Plant number 46 also took a low risk route, opting to adapt the two plane stabilizer from the T 55 with the drive units from the T-10M heavy tank stabilizer. This ensured that the stabilization quality of the 115mm gun would be no worse than that of the lighter 100mm gun from the T-55. In August 1959, the technical design of the Object 166 tank destroyer was reviewed by the State Technical Committee, and on the 6th of August, the Object 166 design was approved, opening the path for it to proceed to factory trials. These began in November, lasting until April 1960, and included extensive mobility, shooting, and protection tests. After its factory trials, the tank immediately moved on to military field testing, where a few minor issues were discovered. This delayed the tests to late 1960, but once the issues were resolved, the tests concluded successfully. Despite this, a recommendation for the Soviet Army to take Object 166 into service could not be obtained, and no official reasons were given. There was no obvious reason for this, especially since the Object 430 was in its death throes by late 1960. In his memoirs, Karts have expressed his belief that the reason was political in nature, as Merezov had more sway in the Ministry of Defense, and the Kharkov factory had already been earmarked as the institution that would build the Soviet Army's future medium tank. However, it is equally possible that the Object 166 was simply not considered to be enough of an improvement over the T-54, and there was no compelling threat that would warrant the introduction of a new but fundamentally obsolescent tank into service. The Object 430 project itself was soon terminated by the government in February 1960 for the same reason, despite the latest Object 430 prototypes having a decided technological advantage over Object 166. In Kharkov, Merezov started the Object 432 project as a direct follow-on to the Object 430, which would go on to be accepted into service as the T-64 some years later, while Kartsev continued tinkering with new technologies, using the Object 166 as a testbed to create the Object 167. Object 166 could have met a prosaic end here, left behind by both the army and its designer. But then, another chance encounter with a high-ranking government official set it back on track. In early January 1960, a minor scandal arose when Marshal Vasily Chuikov, chief of the Soviet Armed Forces and Deputy Minister of Defense, was informed about the arrival of the American M60 tank in Germany, and the fact that it had a 105mm gun. In a meeting with the head of the armed forces of the Soviet Army and representatives from the main armored directorate, Chuikov asked about what they had on hand to counter the M60, and Object 166 was brought up. Marshal Chuikov articulated his tacit approval for Object 166, and with that, its fate was secured. With a credible threat to justify a new tank, and the Object 432 project having barely even started, Object 166 had overcome its rocky beginnings and was now poised to be the next medium tank of the Soviet Army. In its recommendation, the State Technical Committee stated, quote, Given that it will take some time to complete the development and production of the new medium tank Object 432, while M60 tanks from the USA are already entering service in capitalist armies, it is necessary to eliminate this lag from the USA in tank armament, with a speedy adoption by the Soviet Army and setting up a production of medium tank Object 166, created on the basis of the T-55 tank with a smoothbore 115mm Molot gun." Unquote. 
On the 7th of July, 1961, the Minister of Defense of the USSR and the Chairman of the State Technical Committee appealed to the Council of Ministers of the USSR with a report recommending both the Object 166 and Object 165 to enter service. Quote, Considering the significant increase in the combat qualities of the medium tank in comparison with the T-55 tank achieved by installing the 115mm smoothbore gun U-5TS as well as the positive test results of the control prototype, we consider it appropriate to recommend the tank with a smoothbore Molot cannon for service in the Soviet Army and for serial production. Adoption of a medium tank with the Molot cannon ensures the superiority of Soviet tanks over tanks of capitalist armies armed with a 105mm British cannon. At the same time, we recommend adopting said tank with a 100mm U8TS D54TS cannon with a stabilizer in two planes. The issue of the serial production of tanks with the U8TS D54 cannon should be resolved after working out armor-piercing subcaliber and cumulative projectiles for the specified gun." Unquote. On the 12th of August 1961, Object 166 formally entered service in the Soviet Army as the T-62. This concludes the first part of our series covering the Soviet T-62 tank, namely its development. This video was made in collaboration with the Tankograd website, which we strongly encourage you to check out, as well as the accompanying article that will be published on the Tank Encyclopedia website. We're looking forward to seeing you next time when we'll be taking a closer look at the T-62 design itself, so keep us in your sights.